guys got to see today is a very early preview of uh, the first two parts uh, where we look at the causes of the bubble and then we look at some of the past bubbles that we've had and the responses. So the other two segments that you guys did not get to see yet uh, look at the responses to the housing bubble and then uh, the fourth segment is what's next, uh, what the effects of all those responses were. So uh, I think we're going to do a Q&A here. Thank you very much, Jim. Real eye opener. First, uh, I didn't have the chance to do it before, but I would like to thank all the board members of the Financial Policy Council who sponsored this, along with uh, a special thanks to Greg Osborne, Anthony Sages, and others who were uh, a driving force uh, for making things happen, the, this happening. Uh, Jim, I'm going to be very critical, okay? Constructive criticism. This is very impressive, this is good, but it's, it's still the past. I think we need a section, how to solve problems, how to solve the issues. Everybody is bitching about what happened, and I agree. But very few people have solutions. And those who have solutions, I mean, David is one of them, there are a few who have solutions. But honestly, I mean, very few people know the solutions. Uh, people in Congress, people in the Senate, people even on Wall Street, they're benefiting of this. They think this, this is a bull that's where they're going to make fortunes, that uh, we're very pessimistic, that they know better. Uh, you know, they're just taking a ride. I think this should be a rude awakening of what's really coming. This is nothing compared to what's coming, I believe, because you just portrayed here the housing bubble, which is definitely important, but it's not everything. I think the biggest bubble of all is the fraud that's happening out there, and that's coming, fraud, yeah, that's coming, exp uh, you know, exploding. So, um, great job, but I think we have a lot of work here ahead of us. Uh, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's one of the things that, uh, like I mentioned, this is only the first half of the film. And this, the second half, I'm hoping that by now people are kind of getting the idea that, hey, maybe printing money, lowering interest rates, uh, you know, the, the government, maybe, maybe they're not the solution to this crash. And maybe that, that's not who I'm going to find. Uh, the problem. Find my, yeah, exactly. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that as people look through the responses to the crash, they see that, that they will see that, uh, you know, the, the government doesn't have those answers and that uh, clearly, uh, as, as they've done before, they're only making the problem worse. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, maybe we could talk of some of the answers, ahead, you know, ahead of us. I mean, uh, David, uh, what do you see happening ahead of us, at least in the next you know, 18 months to two, three years, stock market. I mean, I, I know your views, but some of them don't here. Uh, stock market, bond market, real estate market, you know, uh, I mean, throughout the sectors. Uh, okay, well, maybe I'll try to answer it this way. First of all, I'm not going to be critical of the film. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> uh, and one of the reasons I think it's brilliant is that I now have a book out called The Great Deformation, The Corruption of Capitalism in America. It starts with the housing bubble and the crash of 2008. I call it the Blackberry Panic because I think Bernanke and Paulson and the rest of them were running around looking at their Blackberries and thinking the world depended on the stock price of Goldman Sachs and so forth. Yep. And then I show that this was unnecessary. It was based on bad economics. It was based on a total misunderstanding of the economy at the time in 2008, 2009, that it was an economy that was collapsing uh, partly as a result of the uh, bubbles that had been created by the Fed. And as I got into writing about this and trying to refute TARP and the bailouts and the trillions that were printed by the Fed, I said, we have a problem here, and that is people are misinterpreting the past. They're channeling things that happened in the 1930s and the 1950s and the 1970s uh, that are incorrect. And so I reached back in my book <laughs> to the 20s and to the New Deal and to Fisher and to FDR and all the rest of it. And essentially, I'm tracking pretty much what you're doing. And so far, we're agreeing 100%. Uh, so therefore, uh, the film, I think, is pretty good. But uh, where it's leading is to the fundamental problem that in capitalism, you have to have healthy, viable, honest financial markets. 
and to have honest financial markets, debt markets, equity markets, money markets, you have to allow the price mechanism to work. You have to have price discovery. And if interest rates go to 18 or 30 percent like they did in the panics before the Fed, 1914, so be it. That's the market clearing, making a judgment about how to balance saving supply, demand for uh, uh, loans and uh, credit, and you get a uh, liquidation of reckless behavior, as uh, Mellon said, liquidate uh, farms, liquidate uh, equities, and so forth. And all of that has been lost <coughs> when we have a central bank that basically has disabled the financial markets, disabled the pricing system, and sets and pegs and props up uh, everything that passes for a price, whether it's the federal funds rate or the 10-year bond or the S&P 500, as you saw all the commotion yesterday, on the mere hint that they may stop buying $85 billion a month, start to so, uh, taper as if that were some kind of real economic word, uh, the market immediately went into a swoon. It's telling you even the stock market is propped up. So therefore, when you ask about a yep. solution, the, the problem is we are knee deep. We are, you know, uh, even, you know, I can't I think of the right metaphor at the moment. Uh, the system has so distorted and deformed by central bank domination and manipulation of the financial markets that there's really no way out of this until we have a massive crash of the financial system that will make 208 look like it was a Sunday school picnic. That's yeah. the honest truth. Yeah. And so therefore, I can't give you seven reforms. I would say, you know, get rid of uh, the Fed and put Peter Schiff in charge. Get rid of the president and put Ron Paul in charge. And maybe you would change a lot of this. This is not going to happen. Therefore, hunker down, get yourself liquid, stay out of the way, don't buy all of this, uh, you know, baloney about this time is different and the Fed is going to work its way out of this corner that it's in. None of this is true. The big disaster is coming, and the only thing a, citizen's, a citizen can do is be prudent and get out of the way. There is no solution to this until there is a massive crash, and all the people that you saw on here, and it really is, you know, if you looked at uh, this in one way, I would say it was a stupidity contest on economics to see who was dumber, and I think it was Bush against Bernanke, and I'm not sure uh, who won the prize, okay? But until there's a massive crash in the kind of thinking that you saw from Bush, and you saw from Bernanke, and you saw from Greenspan, and the rest of them, until that is utterly and completely discredited, uh, we're not going to have any change. We're just going to drift uh, closer to the wall, unfortunately. Well, uh, I'm going to say something, then, Gene, I'm, I have to answer question for you. Uh, I tend to come to the same conclusion in my book, Economic Warfare, I mean, which was published a year and a half ago. Uh, we definitely had a thing. The point is the following. We, uh, some of us know this, are aware of this. Others are in a state of denial. It's like people haven't learned anything from history. You go back 30s, 70s, it's repeating itself again and again and again, the same circus out there. Well, this is one point to do. Your film is, is definitely brilliant, but it's incomplete because it should really shake people, wake up as to what's happening and what to do. This is, this is really the basic part. I'm calling for regime change in America. I'm even more drastic than him. I'm calling for regime change in America. And to effect regime change in America, you have really to awaken people by doing something factual, no, no crap, but drastic. And I fully agree with David on this point, you know, but this should be, look, we, we, we're here activists. We're not here just here coming here to, to be entertained and watch a movie. I mean, there are plenty of movies out there. All of us in here are activists. All of us in here are capitalists, activists, who care for our families, for the future of this country. And we don't miss our words. And this is what we would like to work with you, help you, to get the message across, and I ask this for every single member in here. Gene? Uh, just a couple of comments on a couple of things that were said and the questions that were asked. Uh, uh, 
I think David wrote a great book, and but unfortunately he didn't mention Bill Clinton as one of the stupider ones, uh, <laughs> because uh, he thinks Bill Clinton was great for having balanced the budget. In fact, Bill Clinton was the one who started the stupidity big time, uh, and but for him, who knows, things might have been better. Uh, my one quibble, I was uh, telling uh, uh, the guys, my one quibble, which really bothered me, is uh, is that you had Joe Salerno, whom I know and respect, talk about how prime mortgages failed as much as subprime. That's absolutely not true. Uh, I have been involved the last few weeks in, in, in an attempt to sort of revamp the truth in labeling. There were so many lies, there's so many misnomers about what mortgages are. The very term Alt-A is a funny one. Uh, the fact is that any, all the high-risk mortgages failed big time. The prime mortgages properly defined, uh, which normally have a failure rate of about 1%, their failure rate was about 3%. All the non-traditional mortgages, the failure rate was 10% and higher, uh, and, and that matters because uh, there are actually some well-meaning uh, commentators, uh, some uh, Holman Jenkins of the Wall Street Journal who gets it wrong, a guy who normally knows a lot about free markets, Russ Roberts, who does econ talk, who also got it wrong because he's been fooled by numbers that Inside Mortgage Finance puts out. So I wish you'd just take that part out and try to understand, as Peter Wallison tried to explain in the, in the movie, uh, that high-risk mortgages uh, properly defined were rampant through the system, and those are the ones uh, that failed big time. And high-risk mortgage, high mortgages, by the way, include, of course, uh, mortgages with 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 percent down payments. That's truly buying on margin. That's what fueled the bubble big time, uh, those uh, low-risk uh, mortgages. Uh, one other uh, just simple garden variety point about what's to come. This was about uh, the housing bubble. Um, what else is happening in housing right now? Well, something so obvious that even uh, mainstream people on Wall Street do notice it. The mortgage interest rate is at three and a half percent, three and three quarters percent. Uh, it's uh, that that's on prime conventional mortgages, uh, conventionally defined. Uh, that is uh, probably a 60-year low. Uh, mortgages uh, normally, uh, and actually as recently as the aughts, as recently as late 90s, were at six and seven percent. When Bernanke ultimately and other for, and other uh, central banks and Bernanke in particular have finally got to unwind all of these all of this debt that they're buying, uh, then the question is, what's going to happen to those mortgage interest rates? What's going to happen to interest rates generally? But just take the mortgage interest rate. We have, we, we're applauding the fact that prices of housing are rising, uh, but that's, it's rising on those very low interest mortgage, uh, mortgages. Uh, if the mortgage interest rate doubles, which could easily, to 7%, suddenly the effective price of a home is going to be double. Uh, and then who? Then then what's going to happen? Then who are, are these people going to sell their homes to? Uh, now. I am one, I, now I also want to tilt against the wind of all this pessimism. Uh, because I, I do want to say, just remind you of one thing. Uh, the movie has been talking about what happened since the Great Depression. Bad stuff happened. Stupidity was ubiquitous. Uh, my baseline for the free market economy, if you unleash all those lawyers and crony capitalists, all those creative people who just trade rents back and forth, uh, my baseline for the US economy, for any entrepreneurial free market economy, is it can grow at 7% a year. And 7% a year means it doubles you know, every, every 10 years in, in, in size. Uh, so uh, when, when somebody calls me an optimist, because I think maybe uh, the, uh, the, the economy is going to continue to grow at two and a half to three percent, um, actually not as high as three percent. I think it's really at about two and a half percent. Uh, I point out, no, no, that's, I'm not an optimist. It's growing at about like, uh, no more than about one third of its potential. Uh, so there's enormous resilience in the U.S. economy. Uh, there's, there, are, there are entrepreneurs out there who are doing marvelous things. And let me remind you of one thing: despite all the disasters that have happened since the 1930s, capitalism, uh, to the extent that it's been able to function in this country, has delivered. A great deal, uh, and so we don't. We don't. Uh, we're, we're, I'm, I don't believe in Murphy's law about disaster. That everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Sometimes we're lucky. Sometimes the entrepreneurs bail, bail us out. It isn't going to be that bad necessarily. Things have gotten a bit, uh, worse. There are problems. There are concerns. Uh, but I would not be surprised if we do limp along for the next few years at two and a half percent uh, growth. Uh, well, uh, that, that that's obviously terrible. Uh, but it's it's not a disaster. With that said. Obviously, I hands across the table with my colleagues. I want the Federal Reserve abolished. I want a free market in money. I want entrepreneurship unleashed. I, I see problems ahead. I see the likelihood of a recession. I don't necessarily see disaster ahead or a massive crash. 
Gina, uh, thank you. Uh, look, at the end of the day, hold on. Uh, I, I did not open it for questions. <laughs> it's a dictatorship here. <laughs> Kidding. Okay. Uh, look. Uh, look. At the end of the day, whether being an optimist, being a pessimist, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, the head of the snake is the Federal Reserve. They definitely control everything. I call it the head of the snake. The question is, and this is going to be, I mean, there are people who will be talking about auditing the Fed, ending the Fed, from Ron Paul to others, which I totally agree. Is that utopia, or do you see this happening one day, David? No, I, I think you have to have a giant crash first because okay. everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. all right? I mean, it is implausible what Bernanke is saying day <laughs> by day. Yep. It is uh, irrational to see someone like, uh, you know, the head of the New York Fed, Dudley, saying, well, here we are in the fifth year of recovery. We're going into year five after the recession officially ended. And I don't know whether we're going to raise the $85 billion a month or lower it. We're waiting on the incoming data, which is just mindless jargon, nonsense, mumbling and stumbling. And these people are running the economy of the United States, the financial system. They're driving the central banks of the rest of the world in the same direction, and Japan is now out ahead of them. ECB is copying. The Bank of England is a, a disgrace. That's where central banking started, and real money for a while had a lease on life. And when you have a system like this that has never before been conceived in history, the uh, central banks of the world, just to give a couple numbers to this, and this is why I'm a total pessimist and totally uh, uh, in disagreement with Gene, Virginia. even though I believe the resources and the talent are out there in entrepreneurial America and Main Street America and in the average citizen and so forth, <laughs> the central banks of the world in 2000 had a balance sheet combined, the big eight, of $2 trillion. Today, it's $15 trillion because they've all gone into the competitive race to the bottom, money printing like there's no tomorrow, and it's expanding on the stated policies of the Fed, the Bank of Japan, and what uh, the People's Bank of China is doing, Bank of England and ECB, at 2 to $3 trillion a year. In other words, what was there as the base in 2000 is now being uh, recreated uh, every year, and the, the international uh, central banking system is on a course towards disaster, and it'll take everything down with it because it's created unbelievable bubbles in the sovereign debt market like never before seen. It's created speculative races and momentum trades everywhere based on leverage because overnight money is free. And so the speculators have been unleashed to find anything that moves, that has a yield, that may have an appreciation, to buy temporarily, really to rent, not to own, drive up the price, get out, let it collapse, move to another one. You have people on, you know, $5,000 suits riding on the back of a John Deere lawnmower into Scottsdale, Arizona, announcing they're going to become landlords for single-family homes, buying them up by the thousands, not because they have any competence in uh, being landlords of single-family homes, but because they're getting 2% money from the Fed uh, or from the market, which the Fed is rigging and creating just another malinvestment, deformation, distortion, and these things are rampant, not only here, but around the globe. So it's going to blow. Yep. David's forecast could be right. David's forecast could be absolutely right. He could be absolutely right. Uh, but I just want to mention two points. Number one, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we could have said similar things in the 1970s. Unprecedented stuff was coming down. Uh, the concerns on the part of economists I have high regard for, Murray Rothbard was mentioned, Henry Hazlitt uh, was mentioned, two economists I revere, were great and were justified. And they could point out with similar eloquence uh, and similar insight, as David has, about problems ahead. Uh, other things, other factors intervene. I could talk about garden 
garden variety stuff about how the U.S. is now the major producer of oil. Uh, all uh, so many things that entrepreneurs do that potentially stabilize, that potentially bring uh, prosperity. Uh, the only other point I would make is to question his theory of how radical change occurs. That's pure politics. Well, cast your back self back to 1986 when everybody was saying, especially the neoconservatives, that Ronald Reagan has ensured another hundred years of the evil empire because he's allowed glasnost to happen and good stuff is happening in the Soviet Union and therefore uh, the, so the evil empire is going to persist. Well, 36 months later, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, 48 months later, the, uh, the Soviet Union unraveled, even though things got better. Sometimes radical change happens when there's a revolution of rising expectation and insight, when things get better, not worse. So okay, things don't Gene, have to be disastrous. But Gene, that proves that the neocons were wrong then, had no idea what they're talking about, and they still don't, okay, 25 years later. It also proves that sometimes things got, things got better under Gorbachev, and then the Soviet Union well, I, I So think that sometimes things get better. We don't always need a disaster for yeah, radical yeah, change. Yeah, but let, let's look at this. Now, Russia, Soviet Union collapsed because it was based on a statist economy, socialism, a regimented system, and essentially a command and control economy. <laughs> that was going to collapse sooner or later. It was already evident in the late 70s, early 80s. So when it finally hit the wall and ended in 1988 or 89, it was a validation that bad policies, bad systems, socialism, and all of the other things that go with it end in failure. Now, what I'm saying is we essentially have monetary socialism in the United States today. We have a central bank that is basically replicating what the Politburo did through a crude and rough me uh, mechanism when they ran the Soviet economy under command and control. Ours is more subtle. You have 12 people sitting on the Politburo in the Eccles building, essentially running multi-trillion dollar financial system, which drives the underlying Main Street economy in uh, unfortunate uh, and unsustainable directions. So we're just <laughs> doing another experiment in failure and therefore, I take Gene's point uh, as correct, but it's a uh, premonition, let's say, uh, for what we're likely to face uh, in a different form. That's very hopeful. It just doesn't require a disaster. And uh, that analogy, I think, was excellent. It doesn't require a disaster, necessarily. I was only focusing on the disaster that David's predicting. But I personally recommend we hear some questions. We've got a lot of intelligent people out there who can make some comments. I would like to close with something, then we can score the questions. <laughs> Look, uh, I, I really think it has never been as bad in U.S. history. $16 trillion in debt, uh, interest rates where they are right now, low interest rates, the economy, the job, the unemployment, it has never been as bad. Plus, on top of it, you have a Kazai dictatorship right now with really what's happening out there. You know, um, with the invasion of privacy, the IRS activities, all that kind of stuff out there. It's 1984, George Orwell revisited at its best. This is where we are today. It's as bad as this. I'm not missing my words. So I really believe that to cure that cancer, because we're experiencing cancer today, you have to have an operation. I agree with David. You have to have something pretty drastic. No more Band-Aids. Band-Aids won't work anymore. It's been decade after decade, it's a Band-Aid. They come up with something interesting, creative, to appease people, to tell them it's going to be OK. You know what? We're going to trigger, we're going to rig the stock market. Go there, government Boeing. Go buy stocks. Stocks, exactly. All what the people have still have, they have the couple of money they have, they investigate right now in the stock market. And if there is the stock market collapses, as it will, they won't have n nothing. No real estate, no stock market, nothing. It's drastic. It is very bad. It is what it is. Whatever, we're going to be optimistic. And also, on top of it all, the U.S. is not anymore what it used to be. The U.S. today is a planet. It's not the star anymore. It's not the superpower anymore. We're competing with the Chinese, with the Indians, with others who are uh, uh, emerging. They have more money than us. The Chinese have $18 trillion in surplus. The Arabs have $15 trillion in surplus. We have $16 trillion in debt. And we're talking to them like if they work for us. We are the beggars here, not the other way around. The arrogance, the American arrogance I see out there, it's unbelievable, the kind of arrogance we have. This is like, it reminds me of the Brits in, in Second World War, where they thought that they still ruled the world. You know, and it, it lasted for 15, 20 more years. They thought they ruled the world. We're in the same situation. Anyway, I'd like to leave it for Q&A for, uh, for the audience. Please, sir, go ahead.
if you could state your name also. Stand up, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder, I'm Jay Harris. Uh, I wonder if uh, we could do a little ancient history and see if any of you uh, think that as part of the solution, we should go back uh, and make all shareholders and banks have unlimited liability. Well, until 1931, there was double liability in the banking yep. system. Before 1933, there was no deposit insurance. And so therefore, when you put in de deposit insurance and you remove the liability of the equity holders, you change the nature of the banking system. Now, Glass-Steagall kept it in harness for decades because the trade-off was Glass hated, and I know this, I, this is a major part of my book, a study, Carter Glass hated the idea of deposit insurance. By the way, so did FDR. He threatened to veto it and then got his mind changed. But they uh, put it in harness with, with um, uh, the deposit insurance came from Stiegel. They put it in harness with all kinds of regulation of the uh, commercial and deposit banks, separated investment banking from commercial banking and so forth. And that lasted for a while. But once we uh, repeal Glass-Steagall, once the Fed start printing money, once the uh, Greenspan put was put into place and so forth, it was a disaster waiting to happen. So yes, we need fundamental reform of banking. I think you need Glass-Steagall too. I think you need to get banks entirely out of any kind of financial business except for deposit taking and uh, uh, loans. And if the uh, big, uh, you know, financial institutions want to speculate and be in the uh, proprietary trading business and hedge fund business, let them, but no deposit insurance, no Fed window, let them be free enterprises, let them, f uh, you know, stand or fall on their mistakes or their uh, success, and I think we would have a much better system. There's no chance we're going to get there. We got Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is a joke. It's an uh, exercise in regulatory petty foggery that will do nothing except keep lawyers and accountants uh, and consultants busy and for which. years. <laughs> uh, it, well, that too. Well, you could have, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I totally agree with David about uh, Glass-Steagall, but uh, by and large, I think uh, what he said is valid. Obviously, the FDI, FDIC insurance I is ridiculous. It's, it's intervention on behalf of the government to support banks. I believe that, to, to, to the gentleman's question, that a uh, bank could still become, b still be a limited liability corporation, and uh, it could, uh, you know, stand or fall. You could, it could operate the way other limited liability corporations do, by and large, you know, uh, Whole Foods and others, uh, and take the risks in the marketplace. We don't have to worry about that part of it. But the unique, uh, the, the unholy alliance between the banksters and the government—that's uh, uh, what we have to deal with uh, most directly. I, I would add one more thing. I, should, I, I think big banks should be broken, literally. I've done a lot of work on this. The monopoly, the power they hold, they own 77% of the assets in this country. You know, if you make one single mistake there, it's, it's deadly. I think they should be broken. I think to allow more competition, to allow more products, to allow everything, and to spread your risk, to add to what they said. I, I, hold, on, hold on one Maria. second. I would say that it, it was broken. We just didn't allow it to We, we to went break. back to them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Maria Ramirez. Um, with Bernanke hopefully leaving soon, is there any hope that we could get some people there that actually know what they're doing? No, the people lined up behind Bernanke are worse. Janet Yellen is an unreconstructed Keynesian of the worst sort, likely to be the nominee. Uh, and you, the other people uh, circling uh, the drain uh, are just as bad. Remember, Obama makes the choice. Uh, Obama is totally surrounded by unreconstructed, uh, unrepentant Keynesians who now have discovered that the printing press at the Fed is a much easier way to stimulate the economy than it the fiscal process because you don't have to have a vote. You don't have to have uh, any opposition. You don't have to have a Republican House of Representatives that might not be co cooperative. So basically today, the Krugmans of the world and all their like and kind rally to the central bank as the great 
Polit Bureau of Stimulation <laughs> Bureau. because they can put their people on unelected and uh, Love it. You know, I think it's a disaster. It's not stimulating the economy. It's stimulating speculation uh, and so forth. But that's where I, I believe we're heading. I do propose that everybody tomorrow morning uh, write Obama nominating Maria Ramirez as our as our Fed chairman. She's a very fine economist yeah, yeah. with a sound throat. Maria, uh, we hope you make uh, get the job. I, I don't think I could take the stress. No. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, Ralph Alvano. So I just want to ask everybody in this audience, right? So we're borrowing $85 billion a month, so we don't pay it back. Would anybody do that on their own credit card in this room? The answer is absolutely not. So right there, you know that this is really messed up. I agree with 100% of what you say. I think you're right on the money. I think it's going to happen. Do you know that even after the subprime crisis, I'm in banking, private equity, slash, slash, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. I still have to give loans to people that I know cannot repay because the government is telling me I have to do it. They, they do. You want to talk about insanity? Yeah. This is so nuts. However, here's the difference. We all talk about, oh, we're going to get new people in, we want a new, new, new Fed chairman, we want to do this, new this, new this. You saw what happened the other day when, when Bernanke just hinted that he was going to step back. The market's like, see ya. Well, if I'm Obama, there is no way I'm letting us stop printing money because I have 2014 elections. I got 2016 elections. It's not in my interest to do that. Why would I ever do that? Look, let, 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 let me say something. I, I, I appreciate your point. This circus, they're going to try to hold it at least for the next three and a half years. They cannot hold it for eight years. Impossible. We're at the beginning. It cannot. It will. The, the bubble will burst before eight years. They hope to do it, to really hold it for the next three and a half years so that they control who's going to be the next president. If this is the case, I hope the next president will, will, will be a Democrat. <laughs> so, I mean, this is what's happening. This is a circus. This is a show. This is a show out there. I mean, I mean frankly, I personally do not believe anything the government says. Anything. I mean, the trust lost, the credibility lost out there. You know what? And I say it in public, and I hope it will be on YouTube, being seen by millions of people. We should all wake up, wake the hell up, because this is a circus. This is our jobs, our money, our future. It's being hijacked. See the IRS right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, my question is yeah, about, this may be a very stupid question. No stupid question. But, but no, I can't imagine <laughs> that all of these people are truly coming from an evil place. So how is it that there are so many who are believing this Keynesian way is going to be the solution in, in spite of the mounting evidence? They can't all be just a circus. They can't all be just blinded by their desire for only power. I mean, somewhere there's got to be people who really believe this. What is it that they are not seeing that we see or that I am learning to see? Do you understand? Look, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let George, uh, uh, you know, uh, both of them talk about it, but j just one thing, okay, really? They have a paycheck. They have a paycheck. Paycheck. No, some people don't care. They just have a paycheck. They'll say whatever you want. Some right. people. But look at how many we're talking. We're talking an entire administration. You're saying that this could go on for four, eight more years. How can people delude themselves with something that clearly doesn't work? I just don't get let it. Me give you, let me give you two of my standard answers. Number one, uh, mainstream e economics ha has been ruined by two main things, uh, the desire to pretend that economics is like physics, so they use a, lose, use a lot of math, they, they forget that economics is all about human action, uh, to use the title of Ludwig von Mises' great book, and secondly, the desire to sit at the tables of power, mm -hmm. which Keynes exemplified. So their minds are just completely distorted. And despite that, it's surprising that occasionally mainstream e economists say something fairly intelligent, but when they, when they roll up their sleeves and maybe when they write like journalists. Uh, second, uh, the three most powerful drugs that society has to offer are sex, money, and power. Uh, Greenspan helped himself to all three. Uh, those things do go to your head. Uh, you do lo lose, even, even in the act of trying to do good, those three drugs can addle your brain. 
And uh, so those are my two standard answers to why Krugman sounds the way he does. Uh, he, he had his great unraveling when he joined the New York Times. Uh, before he joined the New York Times, some of his stuff wasn't half bad. Uh, but uh, they, but he was looking for you know some kind of power, some kind of uh, bully pulpit, and he found it in the New York Times, and he lost his sense of reason. So indeed, uh, fear most what people do in the name of good. Absolutely, David. Okay, but I, I would just add, I don't think it's evil. Uh, for the most part, I think it's bad doctrine that people get wedded to, and uh, simply screen out, filter out the evidence. You listen to it when you saw Bernanke in those shots, time after time. He couldn't see what was out there, and it wasn't a mis mystery. It was publicly reported. At the time, he said he thought the housing uh, uh, decline was yep. contained. It was 207. Let me tell you what you could have easily known. You could have easily known that in 2007, we were at the end of an 11-year period in which the price of housing on average in the United States had gone up every month, month in, month out, for 11 years. The price index had gone up 200% from where it was in 1985. And that is not a natural phenomena. That is not a sustainable phenomena. Anybody could have seen that. And yet, he was blind to the whole housing bubble until it really started to come and unwound. If you go, and if so if bubble blindness, I think, is the problem. It's caused by doctrine. Doctrine is caused by, uh, is a, a function of this uh, math modeling economics. And the guy actually believes it. What he says almost every day is stupid. It's unbelievably <laughs> stupid. But Shirley is <laughs> and Shirley, and Shirley dishonest, by the way. And also, if you were in power as Greenspan and Bernanke were, ben, Bernanke was on the Fed, Fed Board of Fed Governors when Greenspan and both of them were doing their thing, and they were cheering on, by and large, cheering on the housing market, cheering on uh, uh, adjustable rate mortgages, and then uh, then the whole thing unravels. And uh, you, and Greenspan was working on water uh, for a long time. And so, sudden, so then you desperately search for rationales to ask yourself. Uh, Bernanke had the gall, and this is with hindsight, he delivered a talk at Woods Hole in which he said, academic research shows that Federal Reserve policy had nothing to do with housing prices. And, and it was actually was John Taylor of Stanford who, who, who alerted me to this. He said, just look in the footnotes of, of, of that speech. He's footnoting a scholarly article that directly says the opposite. He had the gall. Uh, to, in the age of the internet, uh, to footnote a scholarly article that contradicted him. Uh, Greenspan, of course, was also talking about the big savings glut. And amazingly, you t I've, I've, I confront mainstream economists. If Greenspan said there was a savings glut, then I, not that there was little savings, but a savings glut, and that's what did us in, must be true. Well, in fact, uh, there was no, there was a lot of savings co coming in from abroad, but of course, but on balance, savings was down. Why? It was obviously down because savings was way down in this country. So their ability to lie even after the fact is amazing. Uh, fall back uh, on my favorite uh, quote from George Orwell: uh, "You know, uh, 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 only an intellectual could have said that. No ordinary person could be that stupid." Yep. You know. <laughs> Three more questions. Three more questions. Yes, Paul. One second, Mark. One second. One second. Go ahead. You already have it. Paul Slayman. Basically, I think we've all realized it's clear that we need to dismantle the Fed. And everyone's been saying that it might take a big disaster to do that. You know, everyone <coughs> picking up the pieces, realizing what needs to be done. But if you look back in history, I'd say that most big disasters have resulted in bigger, more expansive government. I think all the top government echelon has been able to take advantage of Main Street and make everyone think that Big Brother can step in and help. So I think it's more of an issue of making sure that everyone who suffers from these disasters has the education to understand that these big government expansive programs, whether it's you know any of the big entitlement programs or anything like that, needs to be dismantled. And my question to you guys is how do you do that? How do you educate a uh, public that voted Obama into office? I mean, <laughs> that's really my question. You can't. Oh, I, I want to say that, uh, first of all, with, th with this film, I tried to look at what the consequences of people's actions were. I didn't get into the intentions. Um, uh, it, it's impossible for any of us to know why any of these people are doing exactly what they're doing. 
And uh, that frees me up as somebody uh, to reach new people. Because a lot of people, when, when they're focused on people's intentions, they come off as conspiracy theorists. And it's all speculative, like I said, because you can't actually get inside their head. So I think we can reach a lot more people if we're not looking at their intentions, if we're simply laying out the facts of this is what these people are doing, and whether they're trying to do good or whether they're trying to do bad or help out their friends or whatever it is. Um, these are what the effects are. And I think with the housing bubble, people looked at those effects and they thought, okay, I went in, uh, you know, I got a free house and now I don't have it anymore. But with what we're facing, I think, how, how do you say, okay, I went in and got that adjustable rate loan. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit harder to point at the government for that. But with the national debt and with the adjustable rate loans that they're looking at now with state debt and local debt, you know, they're, they're forced to do that. They have absolutely no choice. It's literally, if you don't pay, you better get out of the country or you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. But by the way, you're quite right, and you make an insightful point, that sometimes a disaster does not lead to better times. It leads to worse times. If you study, look, just the radical change in history, uh, the, the fact that airlines were deregulated, that was miraculous. Nobody would have predicted that necessarily. Uh, 1835, if I told you that in most of La South and Latin America, uh, slavery is going to be abolished and peace, even though slavery had lasted for thousands of years, uh, nobody would have believed me that Wilberforce in England would have uh, would have gotten that through when slavery was just endemic in in, in the in society. And uh, again, in 1986, if I told you uh, the Berlin Wall is going to fall in three years, the Soviet Union is going to unravel, nobody would. My God, they all support their government in the in the Soviet Union, don't they? Uh, well, that seemingly they did. Uh, uh, another vague re ray of hope. Uh, Thirty years ago, as the libertarians and free market people used to joke, they could meet in a phone booth. And of course, young people don't even know what a phone booth is anymore. It's a tiny place. Uh, now, of course, there are millions of people. Uh, Ron Paul w was, was, was doing incredibly well in the primaries. Yes, indeed. It looks as though uh, people support a uh, bigger government, support Obama. But certainly, uh, free market people, libertarians, are now countless. Uh, and that's been incredible. And indeed, there have there be been even, despite the pessimism of my colleagues, there have been free market reforms. Uh, that have inched through. Uh, marijuana is going to become legal, probably. Uh, that's a big step in the right direction, a better drug than sex, money, and power. Uh, so I think that we, we now know how radical change is going to happen. We only do our part to bring it about. Uh, and we don't necessarily believe that it comes from disaster. We look at history, and we find that sometimes it, it comes from the revolution and rising expectations, from people uh, feeling better, doing better, and then hoping for better things, and then finally abolishing the Federal Reserve. Paul, I, I don't want to sound like Dr. Doom, but I think it's going to be so bad and so global that people are going to be sick and tired of hearing the word government or corporation or big bank. At the end of the day, you're going to have to start thinking from now. It's Paul Slayman, Inc., Jerry, Inc., Gary, J uh, Greg Osborne, Inc. Each one of us has to be his own wealth creator his own corporation, and this is what I talk about in the book. You can't count on anybody. They're all a bunch of incompetent. If you count on them, they're going to take over your life, tax you, etc. This is the new revolution I'm talking about. No more big corporation, no more Keynesian, no more big banks, no more big government, no more big Fed. Because so far, over a hundred years, they have proven to be, they keep coming to power, promising us things, and they are more incompetent every time. And the damage is going to be bigger every time. And the bubble is going to be bigger every time. And this bubble that's coming, you can count all the previous bubbles combined. They're going to be as, as big as this bubble that's coming. Mark my words. Yes. Uh, yes, Mark, Mark. Ellen Sandler. Um, sorry to be with the pessimist, but I'm with the pessimist. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And one of the consequences of Ben Bernanke's policies has been to enable the government to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what it has done in consequence is suffocated the entrepreneurial spirit in this country. Absolutely. All you have to do is look at Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, even the nonsense going on here in New York City with the city council mandating about how many paid sick days. This has crushed entrepreneurial spirit in New York, uh, in the country, and that's why we're having the lowest level of startups and we have no jobs. Um, so, but getting back to my, my real question, question is, my question is, what are the, um, 
what is going to be the worldwide ramifications when this thing blows up? Because I agree with you, it's going to blow up. But what's going to be the worldwide ramifications? Because this is now going to be another bubble that the United States has led. So what happens to our monetary system? What do the emerging market countries say to our government? Because I think they're going to be ticked off at us. They keep following us, and then we cause a problem. So I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Well, I would say that's another whole meeting, actually. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing is, this is a global contagion. All the central banks are doing it. There are bubbles everywhere, and frankly, the greatest bubble in human history is in China. It is the greatest yep. construction True. project since the Pharaoh built the pyramids, yep. which caused prosperity for a century and then a depression for a couple more when it ended. There is no uh, discipline in that system. There is no pricing mechanism. The bank is run by the party from the local level all the way up. Uh, there is massive malinvestment, overinvestment, overcapacity, economic irrationality, speculation, unbelievable uh, speculation in China today, all of which is going to come unwound. And when it collapses, all the bricks will go with it. Brazil is just a satellite of China. Uh, all of the East Asian rim, uh, the Korea, the for, uh, uh, Taiwan, etc., Malaysia, are going to go down with it. And so the world is going to splinter. There will be trade wars. There will be monetary wars. There will be a stagnation and decline of world trade and capital flows. This is going to get bad. And whether it starts in Japan and maybe is starting already, or whether uh, J uh, China is actually now beginning to show the cracks and the fissures that have been hid by all this massive credit creation, we don't know. But you better be alert because I think it's coming. But, but also, I'd like to say something. I'm sorry, Anthony. Martha. You know what? Remember, guys, great fortunes are made in times like this. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. I, I mean, really, I mean, great fortunes are made when blood is on the street. I'm saying this to you. Don't be pessimistic and down, oh, it's coming. No. Do your homework. Because out of opportunity, out of, uh, you know, major dislocations like this, you're going to make a shitload of money <laughs> if you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing. Mark. Uh, he's my son. Hello, Mark Aguilar. Uh, Jimmy, great movie. I thought it was really good. David, I'm in the middle of reading your book right now. I, it's really, really good. The stuff about AIG and like the dividend stoppers, I'm, I just read that part and I had no idea about that. Like I learned something entirely new. Love that. I uh, just had a quick question. Um, one of the big arguments that the, uh, the Austrians use is, of course, the inflation problem that's going to happen from <coughs> QE1, 2, 3, 4, you know, QE infinity. And um, the biggest argument that Keynesians and, and Paul Krugman use is that where is the inflation? The CPI is like at 1.6% or whatever it is. Now, I mean, the CPI has been tinkered with a million times. Like, if the CPI was, like, in 1978 right now, I think it's, like, 9%. Yeah. But it's just that it's been changed so many times because it's in the government's interest to do so for the, for the index payments to uh, people on retirement funds, et cetera. But obviously, there's uh, one of the reasons why inflation hasn't taken off is because of the excess reserves. Like, the banks have $1.6 trillion, I believe, in excess reserves at the Fed, where they're just sitting there earning 0.25% uh, interest. So, um, question. Yeah, here's the question is when when is that money gonna get loaned out? Yeah, when is so when is that money gonna get loaned out? Like everyone's saying like, oh, when that money gets loaned out, inflation's gonna go off the hook and like, you know, it's gonna but when is it gonna be loaned out? Because the, the banks have kept it at the at their, you know, accounts at the Fed for five years now almost. Like when are they going to loan it out? Is, is it gonna happen? I mean uh, well, I'll tell you, I think the inflation is not in goods and labor because of this is a global central bank phenomena. The inflation is in asset prices. And uh, basically, all of the, uh, uh, the distorting effect of zero interest rates of massive monetization simply stays, as I say, in the canyons of Wall Street drives up prices for any kind of financial asset, and therefore most financial assets today are massively overvalued, whether it's stocks, derivatives, real estate, or whatever. So that's where I think the deflation is coming. Japan already shows you that. They've been in a deflation for 25 years, but their CPI is at the same level today that it was in 1993. In other words, consumer prices have not gone down. The debt has collapsed. The value of real estate has collapsed. The value of a lot of businesses, the middle market so-called businesses, have collapsed. So that's what I think we're facing. We're facing deflation of financial assets, 
not um, uh, of uh, consumer uh, uh, prices because the world is massively overbuilt as a result of this bubble. There is so much mining capacity, so much manufacturing, aluminum, copper, steel, you can go on, so much excess capacity in the world that there will never be any inflation for years and years ahead. There's going to be a massive uh, financial deflation. Well, I, 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 I'm happy to agree with uh, David. Uh, I agree with a lot of uh, what he says in any case. But uh, again, of course, that's just not his core point. Uh, let me remind you that uh, price inflation was also quite mild going into the crash of 29, yeah. and that indeed was, was asset inflation. And by the way, uh, it's really not true that the CPI would be at 9% based upon prior calculations. Write me, and I'll send you the data on that. Prices, uh, price inflation really has been mild. Uh, I, I, hope I scrupulously try to observe the standard in my column, inflation is always price inflation. Uh, you know, the uh, deflation is really a contraction in the money supply, according to the Austrians. I'm an Austrian. And inflation is an increase in the money supply. We can talk about a decline in asset prices, you know. But in any case, uh, you don't need price inflation uh, to have a, 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 a great depression, uh, as indeed uh, 1929 illustrates. Uh, and uh, I was not expecting price inflation to occur, partly because we have slack labor markets. The last price inflation that occurred in this country country started from a 35 to 4% unemployment rate, rather tight labor markets. Uh, and it doesn't – all that cash, by the way, that the bank – there's so much cash the banks are sitting on, uh, on, on, it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, the fact is that the reason – you know, so, so of course, if that's unleashed, the, the, the economy will go completely nuts. Uh, but uh, the fact is that, the, that, that you know, the, the, we've had, we're having a, a mild price increases, and that's not really a problem. Uh, corporate profits, by the way, are up. Uh, corporate profits are fairly healthy, as you probably know, and uh, uh, wages are, are uh, w the spread between wages and prices is about right. So that's not really the problem with the with the economy. Uh, the problem with the economy is what David was talking about. One last question, Anthony. Anthony Sages, big fan. Um, I like to ask you about the uh, You know, people have heard uh, some, you know, my talks about the book and some of the things we've been on tonight, and they say, are you telling us that all financial markets are unsafe, that everything is massively overvalued, overpriced, and we're going to have a big collapse, whether it's in bonds, stocks, derivatives, commodities, there's no place to go? Should we put our money under the mattress? And I say, no, you've totally misunderstood me. I'm telling you, put your money in the mattress uh, because that's the, that's the only safe place <laughs> in this world. But that's a metaphor for saying that stay short, stay liquid, stay in near cash, that in a deflation, cash rises in value. You're going to have the purchasing power to take advantage of the uh, blood on the streets opportunity. Yep. And don't be lulled into chasing these uh, flying uh, asset prices because they're not going to last long enough to make a difference. I would say put some of it into gold. Well, well that's true. I, okay, I would, I would, I would thank go with that, yes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. If you want to have quest uh, questions with our speakers, you can do it in private. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>